Okay, let's get started. So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to John Erickson Middle School. I wanna thank Principal Tim Gottelman and Stacy Diaz for hosting us at this beautiful school. I also wanna thank the MTA, New York City Transit, Council Members Lincoln Ressler and Jen Gutierrez, and my sister in Albany, Senator Kristen Gonzalez. And I am Assembly Member Emily Gallagher. And together we've put um, this event for tonight. Most of all, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your day uh, because you care about this neighborhood, the G train and mass transit in this city. So whether you rely on it for your daily commute or to see friends in other neighborhoods on the weekend, the G is our lifeline in this community. And it is the only north-south line that directly connects with the borough of Brooklyn and Queens without having to go through that lesser borough of Manhattan. So uh, the G is unique in some bad ways too. It is the only known shuttle train line in the whole city that operates with only four or five train cars. We're all too familiar with the G train hustle here and running to catch the train at the center of the platform before it pulls away is exhausting. And despite traveling through the fastest growing neighborhoods in the city, um, it serves fewer areas than it did even 15 years ago when it went all the way to Forest Hills in Queens. Getting that full upgrade is something I'm committed to for the long haul. And if you agree, you can sign our petition at bit.ly G train campaign. And that is the idea that we, as the communities of the G train are advocating to extend it back to Forest Hills. It's gonna be a long battle, but I'm committed. Okay, so the G train in the meantime is going to improve. The MTA is upgrading its ancient signal system with the communications-based train controls. This means faster, more reliable, and more frequent service that you can depend on. And they're also going to spruce up some of our stations. So it also means it's gonna be a very long summer, six weeks of no service to uh, most of our district and, and for some of our district, the entire six weeks. And um, we will be having a shuttle bus in its place. That's what we're here to learn about tonight. What does that look like? And um, to get your feedback on that. So after the MTA's presentation, we'll have a moderated Q and A some of you submitted questions early in advance, which we will ask, and we'll also open the mic to the audience for questions, not for speeches. <laughs> um, we want to respect our neighbors and each other's time, so please do try to get to the point of your question and we'll get the answers. We're gonna limit the questions to one minute each. Finally, I want to point out members of my staff that are here tonight, uh, right over here, and. Uh, Jasmine in the hallway, um, whether it's transit, housing, or any other issue, we are at your service. And we are just a few blocks from here at 685 Manhattan Avenue. Our hours are 10 to 530. But if you call or email, we will get back to you. Um, if you are outside of those hours, we can always set an appointment. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Council Member Lincoln Ressler. Oh, but could we give Emily a big round of applause because Emily's office really took a lead in organizing this and it's so important. And, you know, for all of us who live in Greenpoint, who work in Greenpoint, who love Greenpoint, the G train is our lifeline. Uh, and for six weeks this summer, it's going to be shut down from the end of June until mid August. And yeah. It is, that's just going to be a huge pain in the you-know-what for everybody. Just there's no other way to say it. And when we got this news a few months ago, we pushed and prodded the MTA to consider, are there ways to do just overnight work? Are there ways to limit this so that we don't have to endure a six-week full shutdown of this train line? Um, we haven't been able to identify an alternative path forward. They are insistent that this is the necessary way to go. Um, the one silver lining I would say here is that uh, 
the CBTC technology that they're installing while this shutdown is happening is a major positive development for the GLAR. And it will hopefully, in the not distant future, lead to more efficient service, more reliable service, even more frequent service. And we all know as G-Train riders and G-Train lovers how critically important that is. Um, as we've tried to reckon with the reality of what a G-Train shutdown is gonna look like for the Greek white community, um, you know, what, what myself and each of the elected, off, uh, elected officials representing Greenpoint have been focused on within our conversations with DOT and the MTA and other agencies is how do we make sure that these shuttle buses run consistently and efficiently. Um, we need to make sure that we don't have a parking lot on our streets. We need to make sure that we don't have long wait times for shuttle buses. We need to be able to get where we need to go. Because if you don't have the G train connecting to the 7 or the L or the AC, then this shuttle bus is the only way that we have to get around. So we've been pushing for um, reliable, frequent, efficient shuttle bus service. We've been trying to work with the MTA to and the DOT to consider a route that it will cause um, less congestion in the neighborhood, think about ways that we can reduce turns onto Manhattan Avenue, things about ways that we can add boating zones for businesses so they have designated spaces to park. We already know how congested Manhattan Avenue is already. And we've been pushing the DOT and the FTA to think about how we can increase enforcement uh, put cameras on buses for vehicles that are parked illegally, make sure that we have traffic agents out from the NYPD, from the MTA, that are aggressively ticketing people that are parked illegally, that are slowing down traffic, that are stopping our buses from moving rapidly. We're pushing the mayor's office and media and entertainment for a moratorium on film shoots during the time that the G-Train shutdown is going on so that we can make sure that the buses are moving because this is a huge inconvenience to our community and we need other city agencies to work collaboratively with us to try to make it better. And the other piece that we're pushing for, we haven't gotten a, 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 a positive affirmation yet, is for the EDC ferry folks to increase their service while the G train is shut down. And we've reached out to DOT as well to consider additional city bike service in our community, just as, as so we can create more ways for people to get in, out, and around our neighborhood. Um, Emily and Kristen have taken the lead in thinking about some of the more visionary, bolder things that we need for the G-Train long-term, like extending the number of, of cars, extending the route, um, and back to Forest Hills. And these are right and necessary things, and we hope that the, the G-Train, our long-forgotten train, um, gets the intention and the investment that it deserves. And I think CBTC is a part of that conversation. There's a good and positive there, but there's a lot more that the MTA can do to show that they care about the fast growing communities along the G line and especially the folks at Greenpoint who are most dependent on the G. Um, so we've got all, you're gonna hear from everyone tonight. The most important thing is to give your feedback, to give your input, to ask the hard questions so that the MTA and DOT hear from our community about how they can make this work better. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to our awesome state senator um, who's really been a great partner for uh, Emily and I in pushing DOT and the MTA and holding them accountable, Kristen Gonzalez. Hi, everyone. Good evening. It's so, so good to be here. I just want to thank all of you for taking your time. I want to thank the MTA um, and, of course, my fellow elected Assemblymember Gallagher, Councilmember Ressler, for working together on this. You know, when we first heard about this uh, G-Train shutdown, Emily and I worked on a petition. We worked on getting the word out. And I must say, in the last year and a half that we've had the Senate District 59, this has been one of the most highly engaged or highly responded to issues in the entire district. And I say this because we have a three borough district covering Northern Brooklyn, covering Queens and covering Manhattan. I'm sorry, Emily, I cannot slander Manhattan <laughs> as one of uh, the Manhattan elected. But it, what I, all of this to say, it's not, we know that here in Northern Brooklyn, the G train is essential, but this is a bigger issue that it definitely, um, you know, transcends just Greenpoint, but matters to folks over in Queens, certainly matters to folks in Manhattan who are trying to get around as well. And so as we talk about this shutdown in the context of just, you know, the next six weeks, we also do want to take this as a moment to think about what can we demand as a community when it comes to better service in the long term. We want to have an extended G-Train, want to have a G-Train where we're not you know, running, we don't, we have a neighborhood that is rapidly growing 
in density and the population is increasing, we want to be able to keep up with that density. And so we're, you know, this is actually just really the first in what will be many conversations in reimagining what public transit should and could look like for Northern Brooklyn, for Queens, but but certainly beyond as well. So I want to thank you all for being part of this process. I want to thank you all for spending your free time and coming tonight. Um, and I actually just wanted to quickly ask, because this is, you know, good for, since we have the MTA, how many folks here use the G train every day? I guess when I'm not in Albany, that's a fair number. That's about half. How about once a week? That's pretty much the rest of the crowd. And like for anyone who didn't really say it, once a month, so right? No, we had a couple of hands over here. So yeah, I think this visually proves that this is a train that's taken either every day or every week by members of our community. And so it, it really drives home the importance um, of doing this right. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to our moderator, but thank you all so much for, for coming. Okay. You thought, do you want And this. All right, I'm going to hand this to Sean Fitzpatrick from MTA, who is going to be um, leading the presentation. Thank you. Hey. Thank you very much, uh, assembly member, senator, council member. Excellent to see so many people here tonight. We agree that G is a, you know, is a really, really important train. And we're excited to talk to you about the really extraordinary investment that we're making in it and to talk through how we're gonna mitigate the impacts of the construction you know, while it's ongoing. So I'm joined by a small army of MTAers, uh, including our new head of operations planning, uh, Chris Pangolinen, fresh from you know, getting our paratransit service to record levels of customer satisfaction and delivering a number of really important reforms, is now taking on the challenge of operations planning for the entirety of New York City Transit. We're really thrilled to have him uh, leading the way Got a number of folks from his team here as well. We have Jose LaSalle, our weekend service czar, who's you know, part of the team that has been really focused on making sure that when we um, have impacts on the weekend due to necessary construction work, that we aren't sort of leaving riders behind, that we're making sure that we have adequate service for them and that we address issues as they arise. To that end, we also have Hugo Zamora, who has been appointed G-Train czar and is going to be managing yeah, you'll see him a lot around the neighborhood during this uh, during this summer, because uh, he will be you know making sure that we are managing the bus shuttle operation efficiently, effectively, getting folks where they need to go. And of course, we also have folks from our government community relations team, uh, who I'm sure you've seen around uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, as well, I will finally to, to end the introductions. We have Chris Rounds from the City Department of Transportation, uh, who's able to answer questions as well. Um, so with that. I'm gonna run through a not that brief presentation, but I'll try to go quickly explaining what the project is, uh, what its benefits are gonna be for the G once we're done, what we're looking to do to make sure that this summer, while you know painful in some ways, is manageable uh, for folks to make sure they're able to get where they need to go, uh, and um, you know how we're sort of working with our partners to make sure that that comes off. So. We are modernizing signals, as you heard, on the G line, uh, replacing the 1930s era, you know, Franklin Roosevelt administration uh, signal system uh, with modern communications-based train control. This is, I think of it as the single biggest investment we can make in improving service on a line in terms of increasing the speed, the reliability, ultimately you know, creating the capacity for additional frequency. Um, and so we're very excited to be taking the G you know, into the 21st century and really to the state of the art. So this is a, uh, an animation is sort of it's trying to explain what uh, communications-based train control is. Obviously, signal technology is, can be quite complicated. The basics of our current system, the legacy fixed block system, is that every so often along the tracks is divided into a fixed block. And trains are sort of registered as being in a block. And then there's a buffer that's created around them in order to keep uh, service safe. It works extremely well. It's a marvel of early 20th century engineering, but it's a marvel of early 20th century engineering. And so now with uh, advances in technology, we have the opportunity to upgrade to communications-based train control, where the trains themselves are corresponding or you know, transponding to one another. We are able to run them more closely together. 
more quickly while maintaining safety. And we also have a, a better view of the entire system uh, so that we're able to respond better when there are incidents. Like I said, it's the single biggest investment that we can make to improve the reliability of a train light. And, and so why are we focusing on the G train? Well, for a lot of the reasons you heard today, uh, you've already heard from, from your elected officials, it's a really important line. It is a critical connection between Brooklyn and Queens and you know, between Southern and Northern Brooklyn. But the reason we're prioritizing it, we love all our lines equally, the reason we're prioritizing the G is because of the age of those signals that I mentioned. They're some of the oldest left in the system. Um, and that age has uh, effects on the reliability of the trains. And we see that in the on-time performance numbers of the G. It, it's a, as much as we love the G, it's a below average performer compared to the rest of our system um, with on-time performance in the you know, sort of low 80s. Um, we have, with the trains that we have already upgraded to communications-based train control, um, we have performance that is, is sort of dramatically outshines it up into the sort of 90s um, for the L train and the 7 train are the two that are sort of fully equipped with CBTC. So we're very excited to, this was a change in our capital planning. We realized the importance of prioritizing uh, older signal systems like the G, and that's why we've accelerated this to get this work done as quickly as we can. So the scope of work is, uh, you know, resignaling the entire 11.4 mile G line that's running from Court Square in Queens down to Church Avenue in Brooklyn. Um, that'll mean installing, you may have already seen a uh, new uh, cable management system so that we're able to run these new signals uh, along the line, as well as a significant amount of track work. So we're going to be redoing the tracks along those lines, including, and this is sort of another real key benefit in terms of the reliability of the G once we're out of here, including upgrading similarly 1930s era uh, interlockings and switches that allow the trains to switch tracks. One of the most you know, sort of impactful sources of delays can be when there's a problem with an interlocking. We will be replacing Franklin Roosevelt era interlockings that have done their service uh, with modern ones that work well with the communication space train control. Um, so we'll be replacing all of that track um, and the new signal, or, and the new signals will then need to be sort of fine-tuned. It's a complicated computer system, um, one that we're you know sort of getting better and better at running every day. Is, is I think is evidenced by the performance on the seven and the L. Um, but there will also be once we're done with the physical construction, there will be a fair amount of work on the back end for us to make sure that the system is running properly. So. I'm gonna, I won't dwell on this, but this is also an example of MTA construction and development, the new capital wing of the MTA, uh, working to deliver projects better, faster, and cheaper. Um, this is our first design build signal modernization project that has a lot of efficiencies in terms of us getting the work done more quickly and more efficiently. And one example, and I am happy to very happy to answer questions about this, but don't need to dwell on it. The we're, we've managed to, with our design builder, come up with a way to have uh, fewer signal rooms, which is one of the most sort of complicated, you know, uh, impactful parts of the construction work, um, while maintaining the same sort of reliability. So we have, we've been able to um, make the project a lot more efficient in terms of what we need to install, which is in the long run, good, because it reduces maintenance, it reduces points of failure, and in the short term will help us do the project more effectively. So that being said, and the reason, you know, in addition to the excitement over the long term of the G, the reason we're here tonight is that there are service outages needed. Anytime you do work on the right of way uh, or near the right of way, in this case, replacing track, replacing switches, installing the new equipment uh, along the along the right of way, you need uh, outages or at least changes to service in order to uh, keep the workers who are doing that work safe. Uh, and the uh, the one thing I'll note in terms of driving us towards the longer term outage, and you know, we did, as the council member noted, we had a long conversation internally and then with our with our elected official partners about the challenges uh, and you know the desire to avoid a long term outage. The piece of work that is sort of most impactful is the replacement of those switches uh, as we upgrade them from the 1930s era in technology. We're actually going to be changing the track geometry, which is to say that the where the tracks themselves are laid, it's very, very hard to do that sort of a little bit at a time. And so for that reason, we're going to get the work all done this summer uh, to make sure that we're not stopping and starting and inconveniencing folks for a very, very long time 
Instead, we're able to um, you know, get the work uh, accomplished more quickly. So while we are uh, doing that work, and I'll get to sort of the service plan in a second, but the other thing, and this has been a, a real innovation that um, New York City Transit in partnership with uh, MTA Construction and Development have done, as we have outages like this, we're doing more and more work on the stations themselves. You know, there's no work, physical construction work for this contract that needs to be done in the stations. However, our partners at New York City Transit and their maintenance teams will be coming in and doing renovations is the, is the, um, is the term of art, uh, but doing deep cleaning and making sure that when riders come back to their stations as we reopen, they're spick and span and have upgraded lighting, new paint, a uh, fresh coat of paint, you know, have uh, are a much nicer experience for folks uh, in the stations. So we'll be doing that. We'll be doing that sort of cleaning at literally every station impacted, and we'll you know sort of be doing as much as we can um, to to make sure that it's a spick and span experience when folks come back. So okay, let's talk about what the customer impacts themselves are. So the work uh, started actually this uh, la late last year. You'll you'll have noticed overnight work happening during the weekdays. Um, on the G. Right now it's sort of in the southern section. We've been progressing through that. We've been sort of, you know, I'm pl happy to say as sort of a precursor to this longer term outage. We've been working, you know, we've been hitting our targets. We've been getting the one done as efficiently as we hoped we would. Um, so we've had those shutdowns going on overnight uh, over the course of the last several months. That's continuing through the end of, uh, well, not quite this month, the end of June to prepare for the work and make sure that we're sort of ready to go and can hit the ground running when the long term outage starts. And then starting at the end of June um, and running through the first couple days of September, there will be three phases of a long-term continuous outage on the G. I'll talk through what those phases are, but to talk more broadly for a moment about what the plan is to deal with that outage, we know how essential the G is to communities like Greenpoint, but throughout the entire uh, length of the G, we will be providing frequent and, as, and reliable shuttle service as a replacement. Um, this is, uh, we will have, uh, freak, in terms of frequency, we'll have shuttles running uh, as often as every minute during the peak, sort of as, uh, as riders you know, demand it in the morning and in the evening. And we will be running, you know, sort of very, very frequent shuttles to make sure that when folks get there, there will be a shuttle either there or just about to arrive. Um, we're, this draws on a similarly successful uh, project that we did, folks may remember, in the summer of 2014 following Superstorm Sandy. We had to do uh, critical repair work on the uh, tube that runs between Brooklyn and Queens. We have a very similar playbook in terms of running shuttles to make uh, sure that folks were still able to make the connection. Um, and so we're, we also, you know, we've scheduled this during the summer, that's no coincidence. School's not in session, ridership in general tends to be down somewhere between 10 and 15% on the G. And so it's the, the time of year when we're most able to sort of make sure we can meet the demand of riders. Um, and as I'll talk about a little bit, along with our partners at DOT and NYPD, we do have a plan to make sure that those shuttles aren't just frequent, but they're actually reliable and are getting where they need to go. So I will run through this. I'll focus on sort of the, uh, the impacts to Northern Brooklyn, but the first phase starting June 28, running through July 5th, um, is just the northernmost section of the uh, G running from, there will be no service between Court Square and Nassau Avenue. Um, we will have shuttles running for the rest uh, or for that section and the G will be running just about normally, a slightly reduced frequency for the rest of its uh, service pattern. Um, we will have a, a couple of things to note in terms of that connection to the remainder of train service. We'll have a free out-of-system transfer between the G uh, at, at, and the JMZ at Hughes and Lorimer. Um, and the JZ are also going to be running, and this will be consistent throughout the summer, they'll be running local as opposed to express to make sure that that connection is easier for folks to get. So, okay, the shuttle bus replacement, and it's worth talking about this in terms of northbound and southbound because of the street network that's slightly different uh, either way. Um, in the northbound direction, there will be trains running, or uh, bus, shuttle buses running from Manhattan Avenue, uh, where folks can connect to Nassau, um, up to Greenpoint Avenue. They'll turn, they'll then make a left onto McGinnis and go over the uh, bridge into Queens and then circle around in Long Island City. 
before returning southbound. Uh, on a similar route, there's one key difference, and this is uh, something based on some of the feedback we got from um, local uh, stakeholders. Um, the, on the southbound direction, we will be the buses will be turning on Freeman from McGinnis, and that means they'll be able to make a more northern stop. They'll be able to stop at India Street for folks who are trying to who would normally use the Greenpoint Ave G station. So because of the way the street network works, it's a, sort of we can make it happen in the southbound direction to get save folks a few folks coming from the north and sort of west uh, a few uh, save folks a few blocks of walking. Um, so in the second phase, this is where sort of I think it's a, a, a sort of a more impactful uh, set of stations. Um, but there will be no service between Court Square and Bedford Nostrand. So we will similarly have that JZ uh, running up locally in order to make a more frequent connection. And, you know, folks will be able to connect to, um, you know, the 7, the L, et cetera, um, via the shuttle buses. The route is pretty similar. It obviously extends further down Union uh, and then terminates at Bedford Nostrand uh, Station. And uh, we'll have, and in, in the sort of uh, northbound southbound split, the same sort of uh, India Street stop uh, available for people coming from the north uh, near Great Point. So, and then finally, uh, although the G will be running again uh, in the northernmost section, um, this uh, in the third phase, running from August 12th to September 2nd, um, there will be no G service south of Bedford Nostrand, and so we will have. Similarly, a shuttle bus making the skipped stops uh, down to, actually, we will be running it to J Street Metro Tech so that folks can connect to the F uh, if they need to continue south, further south, um, and to make that connection a little bit easier, the F will be replacing uh, G train service uh, on the sort of from Bergen to Church Avenue um, in that sort of southernmost section. So the, the route is a little bit different here. We will have, um, you know, rut service running on Lafayette in the um, northbound, which is essentially um, is sort of more like eastbound, but the way the geography sets up here. Um, but we will have running on Lafayette, uh, making skip stops from J Street Metro Tech to um, Bedford Nostrand, and then in the opposite direction running on DeKalb. So I mentioned that these shuttles are going to be running pretty frequently. Um, you know, we are committed to making sure that there are enough shuttles uh, available to meet the demand and make sure that riders aren't stuck sort of waiting for the next shuttle or the next shuttle. And so our plan is to have uh, shuttles running on the weekdays in the peak uh, as frequently as every minute. We have enough buses available to do that. Um, and that'll be sort of, you know, during the midday, it'll scale down a little bit to, uh, you know, something like more like every four minutes. In the late evenings and overnights, it'll be running every five to ten minutes. So, um, you know, there's an advantage to the shuttle. We don't expect folks to sort of be uh, sad when the G comes back, but it will be running more frequently than the G service runs just based on uh, the need to make sure that we can fit everybody. On the weekends, it will similarly be quite robust service every three to five minutes during the day and every five or six to 10 minutes uh, during the evening and late night hours um, with slight differences between Sunday and Saturday just based on patterns we see in ridership. So those buses only help if they're able to move, right? And so that's why we've been working really closely with our partners at City Department of Transportation and at NYPD to make sure that we have uh, you know, the right tools in place to keep traffic moving and keep these buses getting people where they need to go. Um, there's a few different tools. I'll highlight a couple. We've been looking at some of the, so there's some basic nuts and bolts that we do every time we have an outage like this. We need to clear space on the curb to make sure that you know, where we're adding a bus stop where there isn't normally one or where we need to extend one based on the increased frequency or other operational reasons. Um, that we've done that. So we've been working with DOT to identify uh, and, and are ready to implement sort of increased number and size of bus stops where needed. We're daylighting, which is the term for removing parking near an intersection. We're doing that in order to make sure there's a few sections here where uh, buses will be going, but they don't normally run. And so to make sure that they're able to make turns, um, we're clearing parked cars out of the way to you know, provide a little more elbow room, so to speak for buses making otherwise challenging turns. Uh, we've been working very closely to make sure that happens. 
And then there's a couple of key elements, um, some of which were alluded to by the council member, that will allow us to reduce the volume of traffic on Manhattan in particular, which I think uh, all of us recognize as already a quite congested street, um, as well as uh, loading zones to make sure that you know what traffic is there isn't blocking uh, the street through double parking. Um, and then finally, it's going to take a lot of monitoring and enforcement, both on the MTA side as well as our partners at NYPD, to make sure that all of these posted regulations have their intended impact. So I'll talk about the turn restrictions now. Um, you can see on the map, this is sort of zoomed in on Manhattan Avenue, sort of running down the middle of the map here with the arrows uh, or the prohibited turns uh, indicated. Um, the I'm happy to sort of, and uh, my, our partners from DOT, I'm sure will be happy to answer questions about these in particular. The thing I would note is that we worked with DOT to ensure that we are these turn restrictions, which are, uh, for example, uh, if someone is driving on westbound Driggs Avenue, they will be prohibited from turning left onto Manhattan Avenue, or turning right rather onto Manhattan Avenue. Um, that's a uh, that means that it doesn't mean the street is closed to traffic, but it means that they'll need to find an alternate route uh, to get to uh, Manhattan if they choose to. And a lot of folks will, if they are, if their final destination isn't on Manhattan, will you know find an alternate route that doesn't end up using uh, Manhattan that keeps the street clear. Um, similarly on eastbound Bedford onto northbound Manhattan, that left-hand turn will be prohibited. Those two turns in and of themselves represent a majority of where the traffic on Manhattan in this stretch is coming from. Um, so we do think that by prohibiting those turns and having enforcement to prohibit those turns, we will divert a significant portion of the traffic um, from you know, sort of being on Manhattan, conflicting with the buses, and be able to reduce the traffic volume in a way that will keep our, keep our shuttle buses running. Um, there's a similar story in the sort of southbound direction where we'll have a prohibition on the turn from the left-hand turn on uh, from Freeman onto Manhattan and Greenpoint Avenue onto Manhattan. Those will uh, similarly represent a majority of where the traffic is coming from. This, does it, this isn't a panacea. It doesn't replace the need for significant enforcement for really smart bus operations but it is a really helpful tool to reduce the traffic volume to a more manageable level to keep buses running. Uh, loading zones, this may be a little hard to see, but um, the orange dots here represent places where what is currently a standard metered parking will be converted into commercial loading zones. These, are, uh, these loading zones are a really important tool. Uh, you know, when there are businesses, and obviously Manhattan is a very vibrant commercial stretch, when there are businesses that need deliveries, we all too often see uh, illegal double parking happening, which has uh, you know a negative impact on a regular day. In the context of the shuttle buses here, um, you know, is a very significant challenge. So these these loading zones provide a place for those necessary deliveries to happen um, you know, on the curb line without impacting uh, through traffic and without without getting our our shuttle buses stuck behind them. So that's a, a really important tool. You know, we've been working. I think the Department of Transportation has put together a list of, of candidate sort of loading zones that I think will have a big impact um, to keep uh, give us the tools we need to you know keep uh, traffic out of uh, out of the way um, as it needs to stop on Manhattan. And then the the last speed is in, piece is enforcement. You know, none of these sort of interventions help that much if drivers aren't getting the message. Um, we have a few really important tools to make sure that folks understand what they need to do and that there's consequences if they are flouting it. So we have been working really closely with NYPD to ensure that there's traffic enforcement agents and other resources made available, both from the citywide level as well as with your local precincts, the 9-4 especially, um, to uh, you know have a PD presence to keep traffic moving ensure that there's consequences for folks who are flouting the law and that the folks are reminded of it, especially in those first early days when folks are going to learn their sort of the pattern for the summer. Um, in addition to NYPD, we'll be supplementing it with the MTA's own road operations division, um, which is a, a group we have at the MTA who are charged with keeping bus service running more broadly. They're able to issue parking violations and they're generally a very helpful set of eyes and ears on the ground for us to you know make sure that we are um, delivering the service that we promised to. 
And finally, the local bus that runs uh, on Manhattan, the B62, uh, is one of the first uh, set of buses that are going to be equipped with the new automated camera enforcement. Thank you to our state legislative partners for helping us uh, get authorization to have a uh, new uh, tool to issue vi issue tickets to uh, folks who are double parking. You know, we've had this ability for bus lanes in the past. We called it ABLE. We've upgraded that to ACE, Automated Camera Enforcement, because it's not just about bus lane violations anymore. We're now able to issue summonses for folks who have uh, double parked or otherwise uh, parked in a bus stop, otherwise obstructed bus operations. So uh, we will be rolling that out this summer. There will be signs up noting that there's camera enforcement, so hopefully drivers will get the message. And again, we'll have a strong uh, presence of uniformed folks as well to make sure that enforcement is strong. So we're we're very you know we're very pleased with the cooperation and the and the partnership we've had with both DOT and NYPD. And you know you'll see a lot of us out there both on the MTA side as well as our partners at NYPD uh, over the course of the summer. So. I do, before I close, I do want to note that although this is the only long-term outage that we need and we're going to get all the work we need to done during that period, it's not the end of the project. And there will be additional work that we are able to do during nights and weekends over the course of you know, later this fall into the first half of next year. Um, so I don't want to mislead anyone that uh, you know we're, we've managed to entirely rip the bandage. There is additional work that we'll need to do. It's always the case when you're doing a project as complicated and with as much work on the right of way as signal modernization. Um, so we will have, there will be no more, there will be nothing else that impacts your sort of weekday commute. Um, but it, it can't say that there isn't going to be additional outages. We will, of course, continue as those plans come together, make sure folks understand what impacts on nights and weekends there might be. I will say those are primarily going to be in the southern sort of area uh, where the G runs, but there will be impacts up here as well. At the end of it, though, we will have taken the G train out of the 1930s and into the 21st century with our single best investment to make it more reliable, speedier, and uh, effective as a train. Um, we know that this is going to have impacts over the course of the summer. Um, we're going to work really, really hard to minimize them to the maximum extent possible. We've had great partnership from you know everybody from your local elected officials advocating, banging the table, demanding. Uh, additional uh, interventions here to our partners at city agencies um, and within the MTA, you know, between the construction side of the shop and the service delivery side of the shop, we've been working very closely together to make sure that this summer, a little bit painful, not extremely painful. And at the end of it, um, as we continue to work on the G-Train upgrades, you'll come back to a much better G-Train and in the long run have dramatically better service. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Again, it's really extraordinary to have everybody here tonight talking about the G-Train. We want to do a lot more of this kind of thing. Um, so thank you for, for listening, and we're happy to answer questions as well as our partners at DOT. So we have crew made, so we're going to leave one up here, and then we are going to alternate between folks in the audience and the pre-submitted questions. So um, I'm going to hand this mic back to you. Miranda is going to be reading some of the questions with you, sharing, and then um, um, my my staff member Andrew will take the the um, other mic around to folks who are in. I see somebody over there um, for the first question in the orange. Thank you. Lot. Oh, we're getting my yeah, Sorry, we only have one. I'm oh, no, it seems like there are more questions on this side of the... We're, sorry, you're trying to keep questions to one minute or less. Okay. So I don't know if you folks are aware. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, when the G pulls into Metropolitan Avenue, you know there's a connection with the L. There's a mob of people getting off the train. The doors are open. But when the mob wants to go onto the train, the passengers, the doors are closing. Okay, that's a major problem with baby strollers getting stuck in bores and, and people injuring their shoulders and arms. Can the MTA put transit agents there to address the time it needs for the people to get on and off the train? Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. 
Um, is there someone from the operations planning team who wants to talk through the service piece? I'll say it's a very valuable piece of feedback. Um, you know, obviously it's always a, a, at busier stations, it can be a challenge for folks to, you know, be able to get on the train after folks have exited. Um, if anybody wants to raise their hand and, and add more, other than that, I'll take it back. I'm not a service delivery person, but I will certainly take the feedback back to our service delivery team uh, to talk, you know, make sure that they're aware of that as a hot spot for that type of a challenge and that our, you know, operations folks are able to address it. So now we'll do. Was there any other answer to that question? Okay. Oh, wait, I got a, a bit of an answer over here. I got I, Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, we do have personnel uh, known as platform controllers. Uh, they can be deployed in, under special circumstances to, uh, you know, locations where you do have crowding and uh, things of that nature. So that is something that we can look at and we will look at uh, providing uh, that type of platform controller personnel to those particular stations, Metropolitan, or any other station, perhaps. Uh, that uh, may need such a uh, an, uh, intervention, so to speak. Uh, but yes, uh, we, we do have that type of personnel, and we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Great. So now I'll read off uh, some pre-submitted questions. We got several pre-submitted questions having to do with uh, asking what alternatives um, to a full shutdown were considered. Um, you know, again, why this shutdown can't be facilitated overnight on weekends. I know you went into that a little bit in your presentation. Could you elaborate on that a little more? Why this work in particular is so difficult to do just on nights and weekends? It's a it's a great question and one that I'm happy to get into a little more detail on. So when we, we often do track work uh, on nights and weekends, um, it's because you can do a length of track and then stop. Um, the most, the more complicated piece here is the switch replacements. Um, needing to, it's very hard to replace half a switch or a third of a switch. Uh, it sort of is one, uh, one piece. And especially work here underground in the tunnels as we are, it's very difficult to prefabricate the switch. So we're going to need to be in the tunnels themselves, uh, removing the 1930s era equipment, sort of preparing the site and then putting back in that new switch. So there's about a half, there's a half dozen of these older switches along the area affected by the outage in the summer. And that's the sort of single biggest impact. While we're doing that, and while we're doing the switch work that makes it sort of infeasible to run service in between, we will also be flooding the area with additional workers to make sure that we're doing as much as possible and minimizing to the extent possible the need for you know, additional outages afterwards. We looked at an alternative. It's technically possible, but it is dramatically more expensive. It has significant risk to service in between. Even if you think you're going to be able to run service in between, if something goes wrong on the job site over a weekend, you will find yourself unable to. So we think that it is the, the right choice from the customer's perspective, in addition to from a construction management perspective, to get the work done in one felt swoop over the summer. You just throw that in the pit. In the mic over. Maybe while we see that for the next person, um, we also got several questions about just asking for more details on the phases or the segments. So if we could maybe even just put up the slides again um, with the phases uh, while we decide on another push-in. Go ahead. Thank for being here. Uh, so I live off the Greenpoint G. Um, I rely on the connections at court. Hoyt, Skimmerhorn, Lurham, Lurham, or Metropolitan, like hundreds of thousands of other commuters. So this is actually a nine and a half week shutdown uh, for me, like many others, not a six week shutdown. Um, and my question is, I don't see anything here uh, around a protected, dedicated bus lane as a mitigation option. Uh, New York has the slowest buses in the country already, um, and while I want to make sure the D train gets to where it is and we, 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 we uh, upgrade the service, uh, I see really, frankly, paltry uh, mitigations when it comes to how we're making our, our buses run faster. It's great to see that there are buses are being run more frequently, um, but I, I don't see how the turning corners or the daylighting measures are going to actually make it possible to address the blocking on our streets, which is our 
number one issue, that it is very hard to get vehicles already through the congestion on our streets. Um, and so just wondering why we're not doing a dedicated protected bus lane for the full route. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Rones. I work for DOT. I'm the Director of Transit Planning and Policy. I've been working with my colleagues at MTA um, for, for weeks and months, really trying to see how we could optimize um, the running conditions on the streets for these shuttle buses. Um, to answer your question directly, we did look at the possibility of all sorts of bus priority, including potentially bus lanes, bus way, throughout the corridor. Um, on Manhattan Avenue specifically, which is what we're focusing on tonight, um, we do not believe that bus lanes are feasible. It's a narrow street. Um, uh, there's simply not enough room to have bus lanes on portions of it. And on other portions of it, um, we'd have to have bus lanes along the curb, which we do in some cases on a dense corridor like Manhattan Avenue. Um, there is a need for curb access, so that makes it really challenging. I will say we are looking at, because our focus is on Greenpoint, it wasn't presented today, but we are considering um, uh, for this project, uh, initially on a temporary basis, uh, sections of bus lane on both DeKalb and Lafayette Avenue. Those are streets that have wider profiles. They're one-way streets. We have a little more room to work with. Um, so we are looking at bus lanes on those streets. Well, just add. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris, and thank you for raising this, Elizabeth. I just want you to know and everyone here that each of the elected officials has been pushing for exactly this in Greenpoint. We raised it as an idea along Manhattan Avenue. We also raised it as an idea along McGinnis Boulevard. Could we dedicate a lane of traffic on McGinnis to make sure that buses move efficiently in and out of our community? And we have not gotten a positive response yet from the agencies, as you could hear here tonight. We're continuing to push. We have been, you know, the analysis the DOT has shared with us is that they think buses will move efficiently for the portions that they're on McGinnis. I think that uh, a busway with a dedicated lane of traffic and moving the pickup and drop off points to McGinnis would have been a totally sensible approach and a way to ensure that people could have gotten in and out of the neighborhood more efficiently but we haven't been able to persuade them of that as of yet. Thank you. I'll just add from the MTA's perspective, you know, we are, you know, the, the turn restrictions that are put in place, we do think will meaningfully reduce the volume of traffic on Manhattan, which will be a big benefit for keeping our buses moving. So we appreciate, uh, you know, folks who are, you know, passionate about bus service and, you know, we're obviously happy to work with you in the long term on the Brooklyn bus redesign and other projects. Um, but we are, you know, confident that the tools we have in place here will help us get through the summer effectively. Great. I'll read us um, another couple questions we got we submitted. Um, we got several questions around the possibility of delays. Uh, how likely is the project to finish on time? What is the contingency plan if any of the work gets delayed or extends the shutdowns? Uh, what are potential disruptions that might cause delays? We recognize the uh, absolute criticality of restoring service on September 2nd, as we've promised, and we're going to do that. So we know that school is back in session uh, shortly thereafter, um, and we know it would be sort of, uh, there's a reason we chose to do this work in the summer, and it's because ridership tends to be lower, and it's because school is not in session. So we, which is obviously, in addition to more riders, is an extremely concentrated uh, 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 period of time when those students are getting on the on the train. So um, we have set up our we you know, our contractor. This is part of the benefit of design build. Our contractor designed the work, knows it frontwards and backwards. Is not going to be you know. There's always things you learn sort of on the ground in these projects. But we have set them up for success to get the work done. And if they if there are pieces that we haven't quite finished, we will make sure that we get the work. You know, we get ourselves ready to go back. Uh, to full service on September 2nd and go from there. I will say recently we did a similar project reconstructing the track on the F train uh, between Queens and Manhattan, uh, the 63rd Street Tunnel, including serving you know, sort of Roosevelt's Islands only subway access. 
Um, that was a, a different kind of track that requires a much more complicated method of replacement called direct fixation. We promised the community we would be done by uh, the end of the first quarter. March 31st, we turned it back over to service. So, you know, sometimes we cut it close because we need to get the work done, but we get the work done in the sort of new MTA. The timer is on one minute, just to say. Um, but also, we have plenty of time here, so don't feel anxious about getting my attention. I promise you we'll get to you. Hi there. Oh, wow, that's loud. Uh, thank you so much. As a quick aside, that means the signals are being updated since my grandfather wrote the G in the 30s, so pretty great. Um, questions, I want to do a click down on implementation. So you mentioned enforcement of turns, like who's enforcing, what does that look like? And Greenpoint, drivers love to run through red lights. So very curious about what that it is. Two, is there going to be a way that community members can provide in-time feedback different than 311 or calling MTA when things are working? Because if it's overnight and you've waited 15 minutes for the G at Court Square, that's not great. Who do you call? And then the third is, are y'all communicating with local businesses on Manhattan about the change in loading zones? Because I'm personally not going to be mad at a delivery truck driver that doesn't know he's supposed to be in a new loading zone if he's used to double parking on the street. So are you also working with business owners so they're communicating to their customers, folks that are delivering to them, so that the implementation actually plays out the way you're proposing? Excellent. A, a very important set of questions. I will try to remember them all and, and get to them. Um, to work backwards, yes, we will absolutely be working with our partners at DOT, uh, uh, elected officials, everybody. There will be a large MTA presence to make sure that folks on Manhattan know that something is different. Um, and we'll have really clear signage as well, which I think should be, should be a help, is by no means the only thing we need to do, but we will make sure that we do it. Um, in terms of how to get in touch with us, I've got up on the screen now, and I, I sort of I, I cut myself off earlier before noting our excellent community outreach team. We have a dedicated hotline for the uh, for the G uh, this summer. We have an email. We also have our truly superb government community relations team. Um, we've got Andy Inglesby, uh, Nick Rollison are the representatives in the Brooklyn portion, and Megan Molina in the Queens portion. You see their email addresses up here. Um, so we'll be available. There will also be sort of MTA staff, um, you know, including Hugo, our czar. You'll be seeing a lot of him, um, and there will be MTA staff around uh, on the streets. Uh, you know, in those first few days, you won't be able to turn a corner without seeing an MTA staffer making sure things are running well. Um, and as things, you know, sort of get into a pattern, um, you'll still see a heck of a lot of us. Um, there was, I think, one more question, but I, I it has escaped. Uh Local businesses, Lo making sure local, the, yeah, the loading zones in particular. We will we will make sure that we do outreach to another sort of, you know, we, we have sort of, you've already maybe seen our digital assets have started to alert customers that this is coming. Let's, that We turned that on a couple of days ago on the G. Um, we'll have paper signs up in the stations and we'll make sure to do something similar on the street level so that businesses know. Do you have a bigger question online? Uh, online outreach. You actually beat me to my next question. It was going to be whether there could be signs in the stations. Um, but one question uh, from the assembly member is, can we text that phone number or is that only call in? I suspect it's a call. Uh, I, I think it's a hotline as opposed to a cell phone. But we can confirm that. Certainly, you know, the... I, it's probably it would be good if our GCR folks for their own mental health check their email a little less, but they're certainly widely available. Um, and we'll figure out some way to make sure that there's easy access. It's it's a good piece of feedback. We'll figure out what we can do to, to make something like that work. Okay, great. Um, maybe I'll take another audience question. Great. Okay, go. Hi, um, I'm Kylie. I've lived in... Greenpoint for eight years now, and I take the train every day, twice a day to work, which I no longer can do. Um, and I just feel like nobody here is mentioned, but I would be remiss to not share. I cannot adequately express my displeasure of the whole plan, how there were no other strategies that came to fruition, like nights and weekends, like apparently you have been doing. Um, and me and all of my friends who commute every single day, I'm sure everyone here lives here as well. So I think it's just critical for us to express that the community is like so deeply unhappy of like what's been presented 
And I'm assuming you guys are not going to be the one on these buses twice a day, every day for six weeks. Um, and I also get to, sorry, how long is the bus ride going to take to like Court Squared is my question. Yeah. We, someone from OP have that in their head by chance. Um, yeah, I, I hear, understand the feedback. Um, we have, you, you want to take this either Hallie or Chris? Sorry, which station were you starting from? Um, so 10 minutes on average for the bus, yeah. I will say compared to a local bus, these buses are only making stops at the subway stations. And so they will be a little bit faster than a typical uh, local bus. Okay, let's go over here. Hi there, I have a pretty simple question, hopefully. Thank you for doing this. Um, so with the local buses, you can text a number. It'll tell you how far away it is, how many stops away it is. Are we going to be able to see, or uh, or any other way, when the next shuttle is actually coming? I understand that the frequency is going to be very frequent during the day. That's great. I hope that's actually the case. I'm one of the people, the customers, that does ride overnight hours too, and I don't really want to be standing out in the middle of the street for 15 minutes if the the G shuttle bus isn't actually going to be coming. It's, it's a great question. Yes, and folks, correct me if I've got anything wrong here. We have worked to make sure that in bus time and with the, uh, including the text option, is that true? Um, cer certainly in the bus time app, or sort of on the MTA app where we have the bus time, and that also... Um, so it will be available real-time information on each of the shuttles. We'll confirm the text piece in particular, but on your, if you have a smartphone um, or are able to visit our website, there is a, and it'll be in the integrated at the bus time so that you can see when the next train, the next shuttle is coming. Can I just see everyone who has a question so I can make a path? Okay, I'm coming this way. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I live in Church Avenue. Don't worry, I'm not going to hurt any of you. Um, I, I, uh, I've been trying to take the uh, G train um, there for like during the nights for the last like you know two three months, and it's like just never worked. Like this is just going to be like uh, everybody else is going to live my life from now on. It seems like. Um, so I was just wondering, like. Every time I try to go and take the G train down to Church Avenue or like take alternate ways like the F to or the L to the F, like the L isn't working. Like it stops, you know, short of uh, Union Square. So now we have to walk all the way to Sixth Avenue. And, you know, like the there needs to be more coordination in getting these trains to be um uh, you know, like, if the G's not running, the L should be running, you know? That's all I want. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Is the sort of the way we were very, very hard at um, trying to make sure there are always trade-offs and compromises and complications when you have a system that is as vast and as old and has as many needs as the MTA system? I will say it is sort of the life mission of the folks at Operations Planning to make sure that we are it do have that zoomed out view that we aren't missing something. For this summer, there has been a, a real laser focus on making sure that things, you know, in addition to tweaks like making the J and Z run local so that there's better connections for folks coming through this area, that we are also you know, limiting work on other lines. There's a lot of work to do. We're also doing signal modernization on the F, uh, in the, on the Culver line in Southern Brooklyn. Um, you know, similarly impactful, we know the end result of that um, is going to be that the F will have CBTC service just about from start to finish, which will make it from one of our worst performing lines to hopefully one of our best. But there is, there is uh, you know, disruption in the meantime. So, you know, if anybody from OP wants to speak a little more definitively, but we're certainly working to make sure that all alternate routes to the maximum extent possible are sort of running on all cylinders. Yes, in middle hand, I'm going to go to the Hi, I'm Adam. Uh, three quick questions. First on impact, second on enforcement, and third on purpose. For impact, what's the average trip time increase going to be for riders of the G during the shutdown? Enforcement, has the MTA, or sorry, has the NYPD been a reliable enforcement partner? 
they're not here tonight, uh, what options do we have to really ensure that enforcement takes place? Third, purpose. You compared this to the 7 and the L train, but those trains have much more frequent service. The trains obviously come, you know, close enough that delays can uh, occur because they're, you know, uh, so close together within the block-based signal system. But the G runs, you know, every 6 or 10 minutes. Can you help me better understand why, you know, this is such a good candidate for the, the new signal technology? Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take those questions in reverse order and, and anybody from OP volunteer if you want to jump in on any of this. But um, in terms of why the G is a good candidate, the biggest piece of it is age. You're right. The G is a, is a, you know, a lower ridership riot line than the 7 or the L has lower service. Um, but the 1930s era equipment doesn't care uh, how frequently the trains are running. It is, um, it's still quite old. And so we need to make the investment to avoid what could be, you know, it's part of the part of the challenges that we have in service for the G is that old equipment and, you know, sort of problems with the signal system. So, you know, the decision was made. Uh, this is actually a change we made sort of post COVID. Pre COVID, the focus on CBTC was capacity, was adding additional service in places that had overcrowding. We don't have, and ridership continues to recover, but we don't have 2019 levels of overcrowding, thank goodness. Uh, and it meant we were able to prioritize state of good repair and reliability over sort of addressing sort of the, the, the sort of peak of the peak challenge. And so that's why we were able to move the G up in the order and why we focused on it. Your next question was about enforcement. I will say we worked really, really closely with NYPD on uh, enforcement to keep buses moving. There are always challenges. You know, it's a difficult city to do that enforcement in, but I think we've had a really good working relationship developed over the course of the last several years, I've certainly heard that from Jose, from Hugo, our weekend service uh, czars, uh, who have worked really hard with NYPD, building the relationship, getting the buy-in to make sure that the resources are made available and that there's sort of you know full buy-in to the message. So I you know I think we are going to need to be working really closely with them, um, and you know there's a, a spate of meetings that'll be happening you know, sort of on my calendar over the course of the next several weeks to get all of thing, these things locked in, but we're, we're very confident that we're gonna have the resources we need in addition to the resources that we're able to deploy uh, internally. Um, Thanks, Latron. I, I agree uh, enforcement is gonna be critical if this is gonna work at all. Um, one positive thing that Sean didn't mention that I think is important is that they let us know about MTA staff that have the ability to come out and issue tickets so that we've got a commitment that there will be MTA personnel along the route in Greenpoint to make sure that the bus lanes are clear. And we are committed, and DOT has also made this commitment with us to work with NYPD to get a staffing commitment of when what resources we're gonna have out here to support us. And we will be in touch and close communication with the 94th Precinct Commanding Officer to make sure that he and his team are focused on this as well. We'll do everything we can to try to make sure that we have the necessary enforcement resources because if buses are stuck, it's going to be impossible for all of us. We have to make sure that they're moving and the turn restrictions are helpful, but the enforcement is absolutely necessary. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I forgot your first question. Average increase for trip duration. It's, it depends on where you're going. If somebody is able to make that trip to, if somebody's going to Midtown and they're get, go, transferring up to the 7 at Court Square, it's somewhere in the 4 to 5 minute increase um that's actually before you account for the fact that the buses run more frequently but we're not trying to cook the books um if somebody's heading downtown and so they're needing to go into downtown brooklyn or into lower manhattan it's somewhere more in the range of eight to ten minutes op nod your heads so you know we're going to hold ourselves to that we're going to make sure that this is something that people will be able to rely on they'll know i do need to leave 10 minutes early um, maybe give yourself an extra five minutes, but we're not going to, this isn't going to be something that is a 20 minute, 30 minute delay for people. We're going to grab the other one. We'll do one more. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, so back in 2018, during the L train shutdown, uh, the MTA and the DOT redesigned a stretch of Nassau between Lormer and Manhattan Avenue, and they removed the B62 stop from Bedford Avenue to Nassau Avenue, is it possible to put the B62 stop back on Bedford Avenue? And that would hopefully, you know, clear out. There, there's a lot of like 
like trucks are just always standing on that Nassau street and they're blocking all the traffic and everything. And I think if the B62 was rerouted back to Bedford Avenue and making the turn on Manhattan Avenue, I think that would ease a lot of congestion. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very helpful suggestion. I see our, our planners are writing it down. We will absolutely take a look. Uh, Jason, anybody want to, anything to say right now other than we're looking at it? Okay, we will look at it. Thank you for the suggestion. Jonas, can online post? Barbara Schroeder. Yeah, um, so we got several questions around um, travel alternatives that folks might take uh, uh, and asking for kind of increased service, um, particularly asking if it's possible to increase frequency of some of the other buses in the area that folks might take instead of the shuttle buses, the 48, the 62, the 24, et cetera. Um, folks also asked about the possibility of keeping the M uh, extended on weekends to follow this normal weekday route. Um, and then also asked about increasing L train frequency. Again, just various alternatives that folks might be using instead of the G. It's a good set of suggestions. Christian or Ali, you want to take this? Uh, I'm not out. Um, so on the L train, we did look at the number of riders that would ship to the L and the L because it still hasn't fully recovered to 100% of its pre-pandemic ridership, there is space on the L for displaced G riders. Uh, you asked about what other lines, the M? Oh. Yeah, so um, yeah, the M on the weekends, it's, it's cut back like that because we have other work going on in Manhattan. And so there's, uh, we have limited track capacity to, to run more service on the weekends. Um, there was a third question, sorry. Oh, buses, yeah. Hi, good evening. As far as increasing service on the local buses, that's something which we can, we'll have to do a needs assessment and our staff will be out there monitoring it daily. So that would be done on a needs assessment basis. I will also take this moment to note that Jason, one of our fabulous operations planners, is an alumna, an alumnus of this middle school. Uh, so uh, I, I thought that was too cruel not to mention, so. I'm Luke, I ride the G train. Um, one question, given the amount of people that are gonna be walking, especially along the shuttle route, and given the amount of crashes involving injury and death that we've had in this neighborhood in the past months and years, this seems like a golden opportunity to daylight every intersection along the shuttle route. Will that, will that be done? And if not, why not? Only 30 something, so we're going to So we all love suggestions for daylighting for safety um, from the community. So happy to bring that back. Um, we're, we're interested in daylighting for safety throughout the city, obviously prioritizing areas where um, we see a history of crashes or we perceive that it's an unsafe situation. Um, just to clarify something, just so people understand, the reference to daylighting here was mostly focused on bus operations. Um, so we haven't been looking at it from a safety perspective, but um, that's certainly something we can take back. I can talk to the individuals who are focused on that and see if there are some opportunities. I, mean, I can't guarantee it'll be every intersection, but we can see if there are some opportunities there. Just to your left. So thank you for doing this. Sort of one, two, three. One, my experience, because I've been in Greenpoint over 20 years with the shuttle buses, in particular at Court Square. So the bus is there, it's a shuttle bus. I've been through this a million times with the various upgrades. And then you get in the bus and you sit there for 10 or 15 minutes before the bus takes off. I could have walked from Court Square to your on street in less time than that. That's one thing. I love buses. The bus station at Queens Plaza 
so desperately needs to be looked at for dispatching. So often, one, two, and sometimes three buses are right behind one another. And what that does is that you then have to wait 40 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes for a bus near Court Square. It's outrageous. Yes, that duplicate busing happens with every line. It happens certainly with the 43. But in particular, with the 62, it is such a long wait then. And it would, if it be worth the MTA paying the salary of a dispatcher at Queens Plaza to say, this bus has just gone, please don't go. I have said to bus drivers, why, a bus was just in front of you. Why are you coming now? And he said, I have to go by the schedule. That's really outrageous. And lastly, the G train is still a pretty short train. When you get off at Creep Point Avenue uh, on the India uh, side, you still have to walk quite a ways just to get to the exit. Can't you have... Thank you for the questions. I think you're, you're sort of addressing them to a room that includes exactly the right people at the MTA to sort of take that feedback, um, certainly related to bus dispatching. I'll say for the purposes of this summer, you know, having Hugo on board to, to make sure that buses are prompt, that folks aren't in the situation you described. It's part of the change that we've made at the MTA to have a much greater focus on, especially that sort of weekend service, um, that you know we aren't sort of leaving uh, customers behind. Um, so that's a, that, that's a big part of the change that's happened you know, since Jose was brought on board. Um, and you have a follow-up. Yes, and they'll let you cook. I am a native New Yorker, okay? I've been in, I've lived in New York all my life. Why the people who plan the changes, what's go, what, you know, what is not gonna work, the rerouting of whatever weekend. As an example, Mother's Day, May 12th, the E was rerouted. Do the people at the MTA in the office who actually work on the rerouting do you not give them a paper calendar that lists the holidays? So people schlepping with their mothers or going to visit their mothers or their fathers on Father's Day, and you want to go to a restaurant or go here or go there. It, I've done this. It's very difficult to take your parent or some elder on multiple trains. Give them a paper calendar, for God's sake. It's easy and it's cheap. And you. Yeah. I appreciate your question. And the, I mean, the heart of it is keeping the system that we have running takes a lot of work and it takes a heck of a lot to replace the tracks, to add ADA accessibility, for instance. We were thrilled earlier this year to open up Metropolitan Lorimer. That's one of, you know, we, we, that's one of 28 uh, stations that we've opened since 2020, newly made accessible. Um, we have 38 in construction today. Um, so the, the volume of work uh, sort of hasn't slowed down. We always try to be sensitive of holidays, of other needs, but the system needs to, there's a fundamental amount of work that needs to get done. So I, you know, you've got the right folks here who have heard you. Um, I'll say uh, in terms of your other question related to the length of the G, that's a place where there's a sort of key trade-off. You know, the G does have lower ridership than other lines throughout the system. Um, it, you know, so if there isn't crowding on the trains today, we could extend the length of the trains at the expense of running them less frequently with the trains we have and with the sort of service demand that there is today. Um, from our perspective, it seems uh, you know, as, as frustrating as that sort of uh, jog or run to the train should be. Folks shouldn't run on the platform, but um, as frustrating as that can be, it's better that the next train will come more soon, uh, more, from, you know, more quickly, than having a longer wait in between longer trains. So that's sort of been the perspective so far. We constantly analyze it and look at it. Again, you've got the planners in the room who you know, are hearing this feedback, but we also have to analyze the data of where our ridership is and, and sort of you know, deal with the trade-offs that there are with the system we have. 
uh, universally shared analysis, but. Um, Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm Mary. I've been in teaching writer for 15 years. I want to thank you all for being here. It's clear you're doing a lot of very hard work, so thank you. Uh, more recently, I've been a local bus rider in Greenpoint to Court Square, um, and the traffic on the Pulaski Bridge is kind of a crapshoot. Some days it's easy breezy, some days it will extend the commute 20 minutes or more because you're at a crawl. Um, some of that is traffic generally, but sometimes the bridge is up, and I guess I'm wondering if you're talking to any of those boat people, whoever that is, about not maybe opening the bridge during rush hour um, or just, and traffic mitigation on the Pulaski Bridge more generally. And it's a great question. Um, Lucas, I need to remind me which agency it is. It's the Coast Guard? It's the Coast Guard. We are in touch with the Coast Guard um, to let them know that this is happening, that there's going to be you know, a subway line running on that bridge, more or less, uh, during this period of time. So we are we are in touch with the Coast Guard to figure out sort of how they can be aware and then sort of uh, minimize the impacts. We sort of need to iron down exactly the commitment from them, but uh, it's a great suggestion and one that fortunately uh, is, isn't the first time we're thinking of it. So thank you for thank you for making it. I'll say it was mentioned a little bit earlier, just while we're on the topic of other agency coordination. Um, we did. Uh, we are in touch with the mayor's office of media and entertainment. They have agreed to add this area as a hot spot, uh, which limits uh, the amount of film shooting that can happen during the outage. Uh, so we're very pleased. They've been, you know, soon as we mentioned to them, they understood that this is a community that does have, you know, a heck of a lot of filmings, and that it's um, something that they can help out uh, in limiting the impact during the during the outage. Not a blue bloods episodes. God forbid. Um, hi, my name is, this is, this is no, I'm just going to step back from here. My name is Kevin. Uh, I take the G train every single day to go to work. Um, what we're talking about uh, with the amount of time that it takes for those buses oftentimes to get out of Greenpoint into Court Square on the occasions where the train is out. Sometimes it will take me as long on those buses, right, or shuttles that are running up Manhattan Avenue from Nassau to get to Court Square as it does for me to get from Court Square or to Kew Gardens. Right, so it gives you a sense of like the folks that are riding it every single day, I'm gonna be out 45 and a half days, right, in terms of what we have to do. And I think I just, you know, what I wanna point out here is like this, with, uh, obviously there's been a lot of work that's gone into this, but it is absolutely insufficient for the amount of disruption that Greenpoint is going to face with this shutdown, right? More people are riding the G train every day at 160,000, right, than are riding on the BQE, driving on the BQE daily, 160,000 to 120,000, right? And if the city was shutting down the BQE, for 10 weeks through Brooklyn, you know, there would be a lot more than some daylighting for bus turns and, and, and left-hand turn litigation, right? It would be an all-hands-on-deck situation. It would be an emergency situation. It would be treated like an emergency situation. We wouldn't be seeing this 30 days out from actually what was the case, right? So, you know, you said you studied bus lanes um, and you wouldn't do it. You know, it, it's, I, I think what's important here is that we're not necessarily just asking for bus lanes. We're asking for a 14th Street style bus way plan, which you have the space to do on Manhattan Avenue, right? It's a choice not to do it. And it's a choice not to do it because you want to keep half the traffic on Manhattan Avenue, right? The traffic still has to flow. You can keep parking, lo you can keep loading and unloading, and you can have a bus way on Manhattan Avenue. So I guess my question is, for the 70% of us that are not driving in and out of Greenpoint, why aren't you doing a 14th Street South bus way on Manhattan Avenue? So you're right, a busway is an, a tool in our toolkit. It was very successful on 14th Avenue. Um, we, we now always, we, we must always consider it whenever we're looking at options for bus priority. I think we have a unique situation here because we have a, I know it feels like forever for the people who have to deal with it, but it is a um, temporary uh, situation here with, with the G-Train shuttle during the summer. Um, we find with, with busways, um, it, it, it takes a lot of planning outreach, um, with the amount of diversions that take place, not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but there's a lot of, uh, work that has to go in, into it. Um, also in terms of drivers getting used to the new traffic patterns, um, having to realize that they have to turn off, turn back on again. So as a temporary application, we just didn't think it was appropriate. 
What I do want to say, however, is that the type of measures we're taking are really accomplishing, um, maybe not at the same scale, but really same, some of the same goals as a busway. A bu the, bus, uh, the idea of a busway is essentially to reduce the number of volumes by um, eliminating through traffic, but then preserving local access. Um, we took a very careful look at these turn restrictions. Um, we didn't get into the details, but they're going to, they're going to reduce, a, we think, a significant amount of, the, of volume on Manhattan Avenue. We do think that will have a significant impact. Um, so, you know, that, I will say we looked at it, we considered it, we just didn't think it was the right application here. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I'll also mention or I'll reiterate that, you know, a lot of, when you look at the actual volumes on Manhattan Avenue, they may seem really high. It's, it's not necessarily the, the volumes, but a lot of the issues in terms of um, slow speeds for buses and all other vehicles are the double parking, are, you know, the friction that's created one vehicle you know, double parking, all of a sudden everything backs up. Um, so we're really taking a serious look at uh, what we call curb regulation. How can we free up additional curb space, um, use enforcement to make sure it's used and respected, um, and, and help, helping with that is the automated enforcement. And so we think this is gonna have a real difference, even if it's, I guess, not as sexy as saying we're doing a busway here, we're making strategic changes that we think will benefit um, the shuttle train during this this uh, this summer. Up to him back and forth there. I'm sorry. We can do it after. Um, do you want to take another question online? Thanks. Um, we got several questions uh, asking to go into some detail about what improvements we're actually going to get out of this on the other side. I know you mentioned, you know, obviously the big ones, the CMTC. Um, but if you could kind of maybe elaborate a little bit on what actual upgrades we're going to get to frequency. Uh, and then as well as uh, we've got a couple um, pet asks from several folks. Someone wants a countdown clock on the Port Square station. Um, someone else asked about reopening some subway entrances, especially at uh, Willoughby, at the Myrtle Willoughby stop. Um, and then someone also asked if uh, the G train interior will be able to go through a renovation similar to the S train in Times Square. I avoid Times Square, so I'm not sure what that's about, but maybe y'all feel familiar. Okay. Um, so we are in the process of upgrading our fleet. Um, where you know, People may have seen on the A and the C, the new R211s. You sort of can't miss it once you see it. They have wider doors, better lighting, better sort of seating and accessibility, better customer information. That's the next generation of subway trade. It is, it is sort of being delivered on a rolling basis, including ultimately coming to the G. Um, we are, you know, we have uh, in addition, um, so the interiors will, you know, sort of as, as the system gets upgraded, it's part of the sort of massive amount of work we need to do to keep up with the times. Um, you asked about oh, reopening entrances. I'm sure we are happy to take a look. There are often challenges when it comes to, you know, we're we're often not able to make uh, entrance uh, changes uh, unless we're also making an accessibility upgrade at a station. So that's sometimes a factor, but we'll take a look at the stations you mentioned. Um, the first question you asked was, oh, elaborating on the benefits, right? So CBTC does a few things. It means that the service is more reliable. We reduce the amount of uh, unexpected challenges um, because of signal issues. Signal issues are one of the most frequent sources of delay, and when they happen, they impact not just one train, but often have a cascading impact. So upgrading that efficiency will mean that trains, you know, if you think a train is gonna come every six minutes, it will come every six minutes, a much larger percentage of the time. Um, that also allows us to run the trains more quickly. We're still doing the modeling of what it's gonna look like on the G, but on the seven, uh, we were able to increase train speeds anywhere between eight and 14%. That doesn't sound like a massive number, but when you're talking about, you know, uh, in this case, an 11 mile run, that makes a pretty significant difference in terms of customer journey time, as well as, you know, as we do the modeling, we'll be able to say, you know, does that allow us to run more frequent service or certainly uh, to some extent more frequent service using the same amount of equipment and the same amount of operators? 
that's sort of the the easiest way that we have to you know add service without it being at a disadvantage to somewhere else in the system. So that's some of the big benefits from CBTC are that faster, more reliable service that con- that in itself contributes to frequency. It also means that in the long run, as we look at sort of you know this is a growing neighborhood, we recognize that to study that in our modeling. Um, in the long run, it means we have the ability to run even more trains than we run today. So that's not a that's not a promise based on this project in particular, but it sets it up so that it removes some of the constraints that prevent it. I will say just in terms of other benefits, I mentioned the deep cleaning to the stations. That is something that we think does matter for customers. Um, the other piece that's sort of a little bit unique to this project is uh, customers who use the L train will know that they don't lose cell service in the tunnel between uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan. Right. If you haven't noticed it, look for it next time you're on the L. Um, uh, so we are... We're in the process of installing that throughout the entire MTA system. Um, you know, it's a real challenge for all the, a lot of the same reasons that we talked about tonight, the need for track access to actually run the cables to do it. Um, we're going to be installing that cable during this uh, shutdown, so sort of get that done at the same time. This doesn't mean we still need the cell providers to sign up. Uh, so if you are a cell service subscriber, let them know you really want them uh, to, to prioritize uh, expanding service into the tunnels. But we'll we'll have the uh, infrastructure in place at the end of this outage um, for the area impacted here. Uh, hi, thank you for doing this. Uh, my name is Kenneth. Um, I actually live in Carroll Gardens, so I have a, a couple of um, questions more about the southern part of the shutdown. Um, you mentioned that Lafayette and Decal would be the routes for the shuttle bus when that section is closed, um, and that there was a possibility of a bus lane. Um, I would say, please just do it. I mean, I bike on there all the time. It's a traffic nightmare. And I didn't see anything about any turn restrictions or anything down there. Um, it's just going to be a mess. If I, And I think the busway would be great. Um, on a, As a related question, are you going to have the automated camera enforcement on buses on those routes uh, to make sure that people aren't you know, blocking the buses there? Um, and then uh, my final question is, uh, you've mentioned a number of times the volume reduction. Uh, how will you be measuring the volume reduction? And if it isn't working in maybe a week, what, what are you going to do? All bright questions. So we will be uh, partners at DOT continuing to, you know, you will have you know, New York City Transit operators out there sort of monitoring real-time conditions as it affects our buses. We will also, I'm sure, do continued monitoring uh, sort of, of traffic counts in particular to make sure that it's you know, sort of having the desired effect. The proof is going to be in the pudding to a large extent and to the extent that our buses aren't moving as sort of uh, freely as we anticipate, we will be working with our enforcement partners, with our own enforcement staff, with the OT to figure out are there additional measures. We're not sort of locking this in today and saying this is it for the full summer. We're going to adapt uh, as conditions uh, require. Um, the question about uh, automated camera enforcement on the southern portion, there isn't a local route that um, is going to have that ACE enforcement. However, the same additional uh, enforcement resources that we've talked about for the northern section are going to migrate down to the uh, to the southern section during phase three of the work. So we will there will still be a significant uptick in the amount of uh, enforcement. Um, and we have, uh, you know, I, I think we are still finalizing the exact details on it. But we are committed to, and I think DOT is, you know, as we continue to have conversations with folks in the southern portion of the route here, um, I think it is moving towards uh, those bus lanes that we talked about on DeKalb and Lafayette. So we're, we're planning on that. You know, we still need to, it's the second part of it, so we're still knocking down some of the logistical details, but we're, it's absolutely our intention to have that bus lane, and we think it will make a, you know, because the street configuration allows for it, it's a really great tool to be able to utilize. And we'll take its own side of enforcement, right, to make sure that it's respected. There's already on Afayent or Decal. On Decal, there's already a moving lane uh, in the area that we would be converting to a bus lane. On Lafayette, it is an impact to sort of what is today alternate side parking. So we'll need to make sure folks understand that they're not allowed to park there during the outage. You do that. q and I want to just prioritize people who are in the room, so we're going to try to speed it up uh, rapid fire. Thank you. Uh, so you guys talked a lot about alternative transit options, but I didn't hear anything about biking. And you could think that when people are not taking the train, don't want to wait for the bus, they might be looking for alternative bike options too. So more question for DOT with three suggestions. Um, are you guys considering adding 
uh, bike parking around the G-Chain stops so that people can move more freely throughout that corridor. Can you also work with City Bike to rebalance the stations that are around those G trains? They are very, very full as it is. It's very hard to find a place to park the bike, and you can imagine more people are going to be trying to drop off in those areas. And could you consider doing protected bike lanes where it's possible along this route, particularly on like DeKalb or Bedford or Franklin, where it might make sense to have that additional protection as you're diverting traffic to side streets? I'll take part one and then hand it over to Chris to talk about the rest of it. Or actually taking the middle question. We have started conversations with City Bike about sort of what operational enhancements might be possible. I don't have a definitive sort of set of recommendations yet, but we are in touch with them and are going to make sure that um, City Bike continues to uh, serve the neighborhood during this and, and with the increased volume that they might expect. I'll turn it over to Chris for the rest of the bike questions. Yeah, thanks for your suggestions. I'll, we'll definitely take those back, particularly in terms of the parking. Um, if there are uh, if there are some improvements we can make in terms of protected bike lanes or any bike lanes at all, we'll look into it. It's like as I mentioned for like our bus lanes or bus ways, it's usually a pretty lengthy process, for better or for worse, to work with the community to establish those sorts of projects. So I can't promise anything, but we'll definitely take it back. Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Mike. I am from that Southern Church Avenue, Kensington neighborhood. Um, just so you know, back in the day, it was the GG train that people rode. Thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is an aesthetic question. That is, when I go to the Greenpoint Avenue station, the wiring framework seems to be a bit lower than I would have expected, and looks like it would be it would look a bit better if it was raised up closer to the ceiling of the station rather than at this eye level, which basically blocks the view across the platforms from one to the other. That's the question one. Question two, I understand that there are limitations on the G in terms of opto or one person train operation, which limits the number of personnel that can operate a train. And a five-car train can operate with one person. Um, but given the phase two and phase three, where nearly half of the G line will be shut down, wouldn't it be wise to reallocate personnel? Maybe half the personnel, the otherwise on the sidelines, and all those cars that would otherwise be on the sidelines to either create more service on the F train for us Southern people to take up the slack of the G, the missing G, or treat folks to a full length train with two person operation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, I'll, I'll say uh, to take the first piece, the cable racks, We there are challenges working in a nearly 100-year-old system. And a lot of that is just because we're installing something new doesn't mean we can remove what's there previously. The location is determined by the other essential infrastructure that in some cases where we are able to keep it sort of out of eye's way, we've done that. In other stations, there just is essential infrastructure that's already in place and we haven't been able to do that. I do think the aesthetic impact will be reduced a little bit when there are cables running through it. Um, and it's sort of not sort of as jarring as it is when it sort of is first put in. But I, I, it's something we have looked at, tried to, you know, figure out how to address. You know, we'll, we'll see what it looks like once there's cables in it. I think it will blend into the background a little bit more. Um, in terms of reallocating resources, you know, it, uh, this is something that we've obviously planned a long time ahead. We have, you know, we won't have sort of train operators sitting twiddling their thumbs. Um, they've been sort of reassigned throughout the system. So there are, you know, the suggestion, I'm sure our planning folks are happy to take a look at sort of, is there anything like that? But I do think there are, um, it's, it's likely those folks are spoken for uh, as we kind of balance the rest of the system, including the need for work train operators to actually get the construction work that we're doing this summer done, both here at the G and elsewhere in the system. Three questions, so we're going to get through those. But if you want to maybe put up the contact yes. page again for folks who aren't able to ask a question tonight. 
Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, with some of the improvements you're making on Manhattan Avenue in terms of the turn bans and the loading zones, is there a chance that they could be kept so the the B43 and B62 run more smoothly uh, in perpetuity? Thank you. Yeah, the loading zones yeah, uh, we're proposing at this point 11 loading zones. Obviously, there's some some someone mentioned there's more outreach to do with the local community, the business owners, but assuming we put those in, our intention would be to make those permanent because as you say, um, double parking is an issue, not just for the shuttle buses, but for existing local buses, for bicyclists. Um, and also when we do actually have the automated cameras in effect, um, we, we kind of want to give vehicles the opportunity to actually access the space so they don't get tickets. So we feel pretty strongly um, that it's appropriate to keep those loading zones in effect. In terms of the turn bans, I think we're seeing this mostly as a temporary measure. That being said, um, as was mentioned before, we're going to be out there monitoring it on day one and throughout the the length of the, um, the shutdown, the shuttle operations. And if it seems like something's working and it, it would make sense to keep up there on a permanent basis, we'll definitely consider that with community input, obviously. Hey, uh, time G tolerator, let's say. So uh, I'll keep this quick question. So maybe we can end on a hopeful note. Uh, Emily's plan to extend the G back to where it used to go out in Queens. What are the real deal hurdles to getting that done? Because the tunnels are already there. We have the trains. And in terms of the demand, anecdotally, I can say that I know a ton of restaurant workers commuting from Queens to Greenpoint. Greenpoint is now like a business hub. It's a destination. So we've got the state here. We've got the city here. We've got the MTA here. I understand it's probably a long answer, but what are the actual hurdles and the steps to make the G not just to what it, a train should be, but actually to make the train uh, far better and serve far more people? Thank you. Very much appreciate the question. The The biggest hurdle is the, is the need to balance service throughout the entire system, and specifically it's the M train. Um, when the G ran into Forest Hills, um, you know, it, it sort of ran occasion or it ran on weekends up till 2008 or so, um, maybe 2011. Forget one of those years. People in this room certainly know it better than I do. Um, 2010. Okay, I was in the right range. Um, prior to that, weekday service had been reduced on the G to uh, its current terminus, and the reason is that the M train there was a new tunnel connect, uh, made available to connect the Queens Boulevard line where the E, F, M, and R run today into Manhattan. And so the M train uh, has taken the sort of service that was previously occupied by the G. So the balance we have to make is, although there is certainly demand for uh, folks coming from Greenpoint to areas on the Queens Boulevard line, there's also significant, and uh, from sort of what our data shows and what our ridership tells us, significantly greater demand for ridership on that local track um, from places on the Queens Boulevard line into Manhattan. So this isn't a n never will the balance be different, but from the MTA's perspective, we need to make sure that we aren't sort of uh, as, as great as it would be to extend the G, that we are balancing that appropriately with the need of all of our riders, including those in Queens who are commuting into the city. So we're going to keep monitoring it. It's, it's what the sort of folks in operations planning get up every day excited to do is that kind of long-term planning work uh, in addition to the sort of short-term mitigations. Um, but as of this moment, the, the data is pretty clear that the sort of better value for our customers are those local Q Queens Boulevard trains going into the city. And the last question here. Uh, can the buses that take on passengers at Flushing Avenue, Broadway, and Metropolitan Avenue run express on McGinnis Boulevard? so that the buses in Greenpoint can run exclusively here and we don't have to let 10 buses go by before we can get onto a bus and we don't get jammed up from the buses that are coming from the south that want to go to Court Square. And can we please get more time clocks at bus stops uh, throughout Greenpoint and Long Island City and so forth? Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So it, it's a great question. It's exactly the sort of thing that Hugo is going to be making sure doesn't happen is what you just described. The idea of there being insufficient service for the folks sort of not at the place. It clearly will be the case. There are a lot of people who are riding the G, get off the G and get onto a shuttle bus. We can't let that overwhelm the ability for folks at the stops in Greenpoint. So, you know, I'm not the exact logistics of that are going to be sort of uh, sort of in the different things in Hugo's toolkit, which includes sending buses ahead um, without taking passengers um, to make sure that we aren't um, that somebody who's trying to get on at Greenpoint Avenue heading towards Court Square doesn't find themselves you know, with full bus after full bus unable to get on. So we're going to we're going to make sure that we are monitoring it sort of every single day to avoid exactly that sort of a situation. In terms of additional countdown clocks, I know that it is sort of a, a complicated, uh, more complicated than it seems piece of equipment, um, but happy to sort of work with DOT to, to figure out if there are any options. Well, let's it show but Accessibility, can you briefly just talk about the accessibility uh, on the route? Yeah, so it is a, uh, a complication, right? Because the subway uh, stations that we are connecting to most directly are not accessible. Someone from OP is going to know the details of this better than I do uh, in terms of the way that we're advising customers uh, who need a step-free access uh, to get to the their make their transfer. So just to answer this in a general way, we're looking at the accessible paths for basically every trip that's disrupted. So it, it dis depends on your specific origin and destination, but we put together all the information to provide an alternative path for everyone. And we'll be giving that out publicly. I, I, I will say that's it's a good it's a good thing that we got, and it's one of the things we did think about in terms of the long-term planning, that we got the Metropolitan Lorimer Station fully accessible before embarking on this work. Well, I just wanted to two very or three very quick things uh, before kicking it over to our assembly member to close it out. One totally unrelated to the G train, but I just wanted to share since we're in this room. Just this week, we announced that we're going to be making a $750,000 allocation to junior high school 126 to renovate this auditorium, um, which I think we would all agree could use a little um, TLC. So that's happening and happening soon. Um, I have had the chance to work with Chris and the DOT team and Sean and the MTA team both for years, and they're really great guys. And... These folks care, they're here until nine o'clock on a Thursday night, answering our questions and engaging. And let's just give them all a big round of applause. And I just wanna kick it over to our assembly member because she was the one who said, we need to bring us all together. We need to get everyone's questions. We need to get everyone's smart ideas. Ooh, that's when they shut me up. They want all of our smart ideas. So let's give it up for Emily Gallagher one more time and maybe she can be able to provide thank you. Um, I echo, I echo, I really echo, I echo the remarks of the council member. I want to thank all of the, um, folks up here and in the audience from the agencies. Also want to thank all of you. You always impress me with your knowledge, your questions, your humor, your fortitude. So thank you. And I also want to give a shout out to Jolie who did our simulcast and that is actually quite amazing given that there's almost no internet connection in here so the fact that we had an expert that was able to come and help us in that is a huge um huge achievement so um i have nothing else to say <laughs> if you will if you have something else to say though in the future like just Give us a call, send an email, um, come by the office, stick a note on the door, you know, whatever you want. Um, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Okay, thanks. And personally, I think just, she'll just say bye. <laughs> oh no, it's been a long night. Thank you guys so much. And reach out to our office if you guys are seeing a few stew. We're always here to help. But thank you.